Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to Him forever. It seems that everywhere I turn, when I look in this world that we exist in right now, I'm seeing growing divisions. Divisions in the nation, divisions in the world around us. But it seems that the word polarization is the word of the day. I mean, literally, the word of every day. I see this, I think, in every newscast, the word polarization over and over again. As if this was the first time in history that human beings have been in tensions with one another. They forget most of the 20th century and every century beforehand. Whereas any student of history knows, human beings are constantly at war with one another, creating divisions. Mankind has struggled against itself from the very beginning. Divisions in political ideologies, divisions in ethnicity and nationality, divisions in class. These are all constant issues within the human experience. And even when you look out at Christianity as a whole, not just orthodoxy, but Christianity as a whole, you see all these various groups that either have at some point historically separated themselves from the church, so there's some sort of division there, or they created a church from scratch. They made up a church, and therefore it stands in opposition or outside of the church. And then, of course, most sadly, when you look at the Orthodox Church, you also see tensions and factions that form between people that are meant to be brothers and sisters. And so we have to ask ourselves, why is this? Why do we see so much dissension, and what is actually the proper way to live? Because St. Paul is addressing this all the way back in the first century. It's always been with us. In his epistle to the Corinthians, he's talking about dissensions or factions forming within the church at Corinth. He writes that some say they are of Paul, some say they are of Peter, some of Apollos, who is a disciple of Paul, and then some simply say as much, but no, I'm of Christ, as if to be a follower of Christ meant that you were not also a disciple of Peter or Paul or Apollos. And St. Paul responds back to them that they are to be of the same mind, but the same judgment, or discernment rather, probably a better translation. They are to share some commonality and not have these factions amongst themselves. But how, we might ask ourselves, what is the basis of unity or community in the Christian church? And then how do we relate to the world, to the things that happen in the world? This is probably the twofold question we have to ask. St. Paul gives us a hint at the end of this reading. He says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, when it says the message of the cross, that's actually the word of the cross in Greek. Literally, that word that comes from us, that word that is spoken to us by God and has revealed to us what Christ has done for us in the cross and in His resurrection on the third day and in the sending of His Holy Spirit on Pentecost. This is the word of the cross. This is what Christ has revealed. And it is truly the disclosure of God's intent for mankind. So what is this word of the cross then? Well, first of all, we have to understand the word of the cross is a radical word. It's not something calm. It's not something, something simple. It's something powerful, rather. Jesus Christ says in the Gospel of Matthew, do you think, not think that I came to bring peace on the earth? I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. For he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. This is the radicalness of the word of the cross. The fact that the word of the cross is one that actually is a judgment upon this world. It puts us at odds with the sin and the selfishness of the world around us. As St. James writes in his epistle, he says, Friendship with the world is enmity with God. And so if we want to begin to understand what Christ has told us, the first thing we have to understand is to be an Orthodox Christian means in some sense to be separate from the world, to be in, at odds with worldliness. Now why is the word of the cross foolish to those in the world? In other words, those who are perishing, St. Paul says. 
I sometimes like to go back into older categories and examples as a historian, and I think that we can look at the various schools of Greek philosophy and see some of what exists today all the way back then, 2,000 years ago. In particular, there are these two groups. The first one were the Epicureans. Now, you may have heard of the Epicureans because they were a type of hedonists, and therefore they thought that the pursuit of pleasure was the most important thing in life. That was the good in life, was to pursue pleasure and try to reduce pain as much as possible. Avoid suffering in any way you can, as much as possible, and pursue pleasure. And in that way you'll be happy in this world. Now that sounds like probably a majority of people living today, especially in the West. We are people oftentimes that are just pursuing pleasure and minimizing the pain. That is what our life is about, and we think that is happiness. Now there's another camp, another school of philosophical thought in the first century, and those were the cynics. And the cynics were a little different than the Epicureans. Because the cynics, although they didn't really believe in the normal societal structures and in the, uh, the, norm, the norms of society, they still believed that there was a certain uh, form to nature itself. There was a way to be in conformity with the natural world. And so they were the disciplined ones, you see. They didn't just pursue pleasure. They were willing to deny themselves some things in order to find a sort of balance with nature. And this probably represents the other part of modern people. The people that maybe just don't run around pursuing pleasure, they are more disciplined in their lives, the ones who follow the self-help programs, the ones who read books on stoicism and so forth, the ones who try to have discipline in their lives because they think it's for a greater happiness in this life. Again, both of these have one commonality. They're focused on this world. They're focused on happiness here and now. One, in the complete pursuit of pleasure, and the other one in some discipline in order to find happiness through discipline and through structure. But both of them are focused on the here and now, on what's right in front of them. And so the word of the cross is a judgment on both of these styles of life. It's a judgment because it's a judgment on this world and tells us that the happiness that we seek is not here and now. We may see glimmers of joy in this world, but it is the world to come where things will be the way they're meant to be. Ultimately, the word of the cross then is extremely pragmatic. It's realism, because it tells us that this world is filled with suffering. There's injustice in this world, it's a reality, and we're not going to get rid of it through human measures. We might be able to mitigate some of it, but we're not going to get rid of it. And so the word of the cross tells us that there's something greater than the suffering and the injustice of this world. Christ shows us that He will have the last word. By His resurrection on the third day, and His ascension to heaven, He shows us that the suffering, the injustice of this world cannot defeat God. He shows us by hanging on the cross what it means to be at odds with the world and yet to embrace the world as He prayed for those who persecuted Him. And He also promises us that He will come again and He will institute justice and a removal of suffering for those who have been faithful in the age to come. While we live in this world, He continues to offer us peace and contentment, but only in following Him and accepting the suffering and justice that comes within this current life. The world may be broken, it may be polarized, but the world only offers a false peace, a temporary, a worldly peace that fades very quickly while Christ offers us a peace that surpasses understanding, as St. Paul writes. So in one sense, the word of the cross is division, but it's division out from that which is wrong in the world. And by separating us out from the world, the word of the cross tells us that we are then to stand together, not as individuals, not me against the world, but we are to stand together as the church, to unite as one people, as the Orthodox, both here and throughout the world. This is why St. Paul is so vexed that there were factions forming at Corinth. This is why he's dealing with it in this passage. You see, if each member of that community had taken the word of the cross seriously, they would spend their days denying themselves, picking up their own cross, and following Christ, as our Lord commands us in the Gospel. 
in their personal, constant acts of self-denial, they would be affirming their love to one another, binding themselves together as a community. Throughout St. Paul's other letters, we have many examples of what this looks like. He tells us that it means frequently speaking uh, for acts of forgiveness towards one another, bearing with one another's weaknesses, being charitable towards one another, and of course avoiding scandal. There's so much gossip and scandal that happens even amongst Christians where they are putting one another down and attacking one another. And of course, St. Paul always rejects this. Importantly also, St. Paul stresses that like any family, the church community has order. There is hierarchy within the church. We look to the, the bishops and our clergy as fathers to guide us. And so there's a sense of order that's based in love and it brings about Christ's peace within the people of God. Now then, we have to look back at our relationship to the world then, at all this division that happens within the world, or this constant battle between peoples. Because you see, if we are being the church, then it is our responsibility to show the world a better way. Not to be mired in the fights and divisions of the world, but to transcend them and to show something greater, something higher. Now there's three things that we can do. There's not much we can do to heal polarization directly, but we can, by being the church, do some things towards revealing the kingdom of God within this present world. And the first thing is probably a negative commandment. In other words, something we should not do. We should not contribute to polarization by stirring up controversy purposely. When we go out and try to throw fuel on the fire in the world, we're not doing much good to bring about peace between human beings. The second thing that we can do is to pray for the world rather than simply judging it. It's easy to judge the world. It's easy to judge those who fall under the sway of Satan. But Christ tells us that he's not very fond of us taking his place on the throne of judgment. He doesn't like it when we usurp his authority, and he tells us not to judge. St. Paul even goes so far as to say, how can you judge those who are outside? Because they don't know Christ. Therefore, we have to pray for them and commend them to God. But that's not all we do, because prayer sometimes can be seen as an escape. We run away from the world and pray for it, and just hope things will work out. That's not all we're called to do. We are called to personally, each of us individually, and as a body, as a church, embody the presence of God in our lives, through our spiritual life, through our personal prayer and acts of charity, through everything we do in the life of the church. And when we embody the presence of God, then we become emissaries of His peace and His love in the world. We can't just preach at the world won't do much good because they don't know Christ. We need to show them what it means to have a relationship with Christ through our own lives, through our example. And by that example, to help lead people to the church. Because once they encounter the living God, the risen Lord, then they can understand what this is about. Then they can become accountable for the lives they lead, for the divisions they cause, for the sins that they enact in their own lives. Not until then. So then the word of the cross is an answer to everything. It's an answer to who we are meant to be, to the the divisions within our own soul, as we crucify the flesh, as St. Paul writes, and turn ourselves over to Christ in self-denial, we heal the divisions in our own person. The word of the cross leads to the healing of the divisions within the church, when we put Christ first, instead of forming factions and dissensions. And finally, the word of the cross is that message to the world as well. It shows us what we are to do. We are to go out and bear Christ. We are to show them what it means to be His follower in the world. And as we do this, we can in some part bring about God's peace, even here and now. Ultimately, it's only when He comes to judge that justice and suffering will be no more. It is only at that point that all divisions will cease, and those who love Christ will be united to Him, and those who do not love Christ will see what their fruits have borne. But we ourselves have to continue on to bear our cross, to bear it humbly, because this is the only way that we ourselves can overcome the divisions and mourn within ourselves, and that we may be united to the crucified Lord, 
even our Savior and God, Jesus Christ. Who together with his unrichen Father, as all holy good and life-giving spirit, are worshipped and glorified in the ages of ages. 